So I'm delighted to be here, standing in front of this bench, but it's not the first time I have stood here. This was me several years ago, standing here. In fact, I think I spent most of my time standing that side. Uh, but here I am, talking with great product placement, as you'll see. <laughs> I've got my bottle of Iron Brew there. Proud drink from Scotland. Uh, and of course, actually, what I was talking about was iron. Uh, I'm not going to talk about iron tonight. Uh, platinum is going to be the metal of choice for me tonight. But I was talking about iron there. And I was just delighted to do it then, and I'm delighted to come back today. But why I'm particularly pleased to be here is because this year, the Royal Institution is doing its Friday evening discourses to celebrate women in science. And that's taken from the website. The RI will celebrate women in science with its first ever all women lineup for a year of Friday evening discourses. And when I looked to see who else was doing the Friday evening uh, discourses, how pleased was I to join the ranks of people like Pratiba, Judith, and Philippa there. Uh, great, great uh, role models for women in science, uh, and I'm just delighted to be one of them. But why is it important that we celebrate women in science, and why is it important we even talk about women in science? And the reason is, is because of this awful graph. I always show this awful graph whenever I speak. This awful graph here showing the leaky pipeline of women in science. These, uh, these are the figures from Scotland because, of course, I'm based in Edinburgh. Uh, and so it's easy for me to get the figures from Scotland. And these are the Scottish figures, but the figures for Scotland are no different from the UK, are no different from Europe, are no different from the States, are no different from everywhere else in the world. There is always a leaky pipeline. We simply cannot retain the number of women in science and engineering. And I think that is a crime, actually. <coughs> If we're getting rid of large, vast numbers of our population by not retaining women to do science and engineering, how are we going to solve a lot of the big global challenges that science and engineering desperately, desperately need to solve? So you see six lines there. For those who can't see, and, I'm, uh, and I know them, so I'm just uh, remembering them. The red line is biology. The turquoise line is chemistry, and chemistry is my subject. So the turquoise line is chemistry. The black line is maths. The yellow line is computing. The line green line is physics, and the gray line is engineering. And what each and every subject shows you is from the right, the left-hand side. Get it right, Leslie. The left-hand side, which is standard grade or. Um, exams you take at 15 years old at school, all the way over to the right-hand side here, which is professors. So that's all the way through to senior positions. Every one of those lines shows a negative slope from the left-hand side through to the right-hand side. Every one of them. And the worst sloping line, the one with the worst gradient, the steepest gradient, I'm ashamed to say, is chemistry. But every one of those lines shows a steep decline. Now, in some subjects, such as biology, there's a huge uptake at school. Let's see if I can work this. So here, way, way over 50%. We're nearly at 70% of the young people who present for biology at school are female. And yet, if you look over here, there's only 16% of them make it through to being professor. 16% of the total population of, of professors in biology are female. Some subjects, such as engineering, they don't do at school. 
And so they tend to, it's still down, but there's less of a leakage in subjects such as uh, engineering. Now, when I first showed this graph, was um, in fact at a place you don't like me to mention uh, in another part of London. <laughs> and I first showed that graph and somebody in the audience said to me, Leslie, do you realize you are more endangered than a giant panda? <laughs> now, I've been called many things in my life but being compared to a giant panda was a first. And the reason for telling you that story, other than it's amusing, is that it allows me to show this picture. <laughs> I got to feed the giant panda because I was president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And I was the first female president of the Royal Society of Chemistry in its 170 odd year history. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we happen to have the top scientist from China visiting us in the UK, and he came up to Edinburgh. And I was asked if I would host him, and I said, certainly, of course, we'll host, I'll host him. I'm delighted to, to see him. And he said, and they said to me, and what we're going to do is we're going to take him to see the pandas. <laughs> and I thought, what a stupid thing, to, he must have fed pandas every day. <laughs> right, fine, I've not seen the panda, so I'll go, I'm up for that. So, do you know, he'd never fed a panda before, so he was delighted, and I was delighted. <laughs> and I got to feed the panda. And let me tell you that if you ever get the opportunity of feeding a panda at the zoo, and we have two, although well, they still can't get pregnant, but anyway, there is two of them, um, uh, feed the male. Because the male is, and I hate to say this, the male's really friendly. <laughs> and the reason he's friendly is, of course, that he's been, ha he's been um, in ca captivity uh, all his life. So he's quite used to people. But he was delightful um, to, to meet. Uh, and the other reason for showing that is that, um, of course, we're not as endangered as the giant pandas because in Edinburgh we have two giant pandas and we have four women professors in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> so the leaky pipeline, actually I was part of the leaky pipeline for a while because I did chemical physics at university in Edinburgh, and when I got my degree, I left. I left doing science, I left doing chemistry, and I left doing science because I thought that I would get a more exciting job doing something out of science, um, and that I was fed up doing studying, and I didn't want to do it any longer. And so I left science. And that was the biggest, that was the most stupid mistake I ever did, because in pretty short order, actually, I realized that I, I loved doing science and I needed to get back into doing science again. So, uh, the same year as I made that very stupid mistake, I also did the best thing I did in my life, and I got married to Peter, and Peter's here in the audience, and uh, thank you very much for uh, tolerating and, and uh, being with me all those years. But we went to Australia at that point in time. We decided we'd go uh, and live in Australia. And Peter got, uh, uh, let me uh, tell you, Peter is an accountant. So Peter can get jobs anywhere in the world. <laughs> so he got a very good job in Australia and I went with him. And isn't it funny how serendipity or luck just plays a part in your life? Because I went to Australia with Peter, who had a job, and I got a job very quickly. I got a job in a laboratory. I got a job as being an assistant to the professor who was head of department at the time. And those were very wealthy days in Australia because actually I have to say, the job I got, I had no PhD, remember, here. I only have a first degree. I ended up being paid more than Peter did as an accountant. <laughs> I don't think that's the case any longer. Shame. But I got a job in a lab uh, there doing science, doing research, and
and I worked in Laurie Lyons' lab, and he was researching solar energy. It was, was in Brisbane. What better place could you research solar energy than Brisbane? But that began my lifelong love affair, I suppose, or my lifelong work in solar energy. And it wasn't something I deliberately went into. It happened to me, and I really loved it. And I think that happens to many of us. Things happen, and you take the opportunity. So I started then to work, and I came back on the curve again, stopped being in the uh, leaky pipeline, uh, and uh, took up doing solar energy research. I then came back to the UK again because uh, Peter was offered a, uh, a good job opportunity in Edinburgh, and I came back and realised that if, actually if I wanted to succeed in science, I had to do a PhD. So I studied for a PhD again in solar energy, and that's really where my love for energy has gone. So what I want to spend some time talking with you tonight is indeed about energy. And it's about our use of energy. We all use energy every day. We in the West use huge amounts of energy. So if we want to get many places, we'll fly. I didn't fly. In fact, I took the train down because I'm a bit conscious of uh, my carbon footprint. So I got the train down today. But I could have flown down. Uh, so we use energy to fly, to travel. We can travel in cars here. It's uh, Birmingham, I think, isn't it? Yep. Um, we use it for heating here, or if you're in a hot place, you use energy to, for air conditioning to cool. We like to have to, to live in a really very narrow temperature range, and we will use energy in order to maintain that very narrow temperature range. We use it in uh, industry, of course, for our factories, and we use it to make and deliver food. You can all think of numerous ways in which we use energy. So here's the audience participation part of, of the lecture. Let's think about how much energy we use all the time, every day, if averaged out over a day. And I can give you numbers, I can give you watts, terawatts, petawatts, whatever number of watts you want, or gigawatt hours, or whatever you want. But numbers, you know, like that, in my mind, don't mean anything. It's much easier to think, how much energy am I using by imagining that I have got an energy slave, and he's cycling away on a bike for me. And I'll put him in my garage, because I don't really want to see him sweating. <laughs> Um, so how many energy slaves do you think I need? Do you think I need one? Do you think I need two? Do you think I need three pedaling away 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year? Well, before I ask you, here's some, um, just some idea to help you do a quick calculation in your head. So here we are. This is how much you have to cycle here to power each and every one of these. So I think most of us in the room could probably manage the phone charger at two kilometers an hour, probably. I doubt I could get to the laptop, actually. Some of you might get to the Xbox or the light bulb, but nobody's going to get to the kettle. Nobody is going to be able to cycle at 800 kilometers an hour. So. Looking at that, how many energy slaves do you think I would need? Yeah. 20? 30? 100? 300? God, I, how big is my garage, for goodness sake? <laughs> right? <laughs> In fact, I need 100. I would need 100 energy slaves simply to generate enough power for me to get through my day. Um, and that's similar to a Roman, a, a Roman noble. That was a definition of a Roman noble. He had 100 slaves. So we're all being the equivalent of a Roman noble. And the question then is, is, is this sustainable? And I hope you would all just shout back to me. Thank you. But before I do that, just think of this. The jumbo jet needs 1,600,000 energy slaves simply to get going. That's some hanger it's got. Right. So if we look at historically uh, energy consumption, 
then for most of the time that humans have been inhabiting this planet, then we've really been not used much energy at all. And the energy that we have used has come from humans, from uh, animals, uh, from fire and from wind. And then what happened is that we got the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution started and we've had massive exploitation here of uh, fossil fuels. It's gone up exponentially. That's a huge rate, okay? So that's how much in that very short period of time since the Industrial Revolution, over the period of mankind on Earth, that's how much energy we now use. So the question then is, can we go on? Can this last forever? And the obvious answer again is, no, it can't. And if you stop and think about it, or let me tell you that the energy that we use, that huge spike that we're presently using, over 80% of that energy comes from fossil fuels. It comes from non-renewable sources. 80%, over 80%. Okay, there's 32% uh, oil, 27 coal, 21% natural gas. All of those are non-renewable energy sources. We only have one go at burning them, and then they're gone. So here's a graph of the makeup of how we've used that oil. Uh, the different, uh, so here the, sorry, so the dark color here are the OECD countries such as us, um, Europe, uh, America, Australia, etc. Uh, and then the reddish color is the non-OECD countries. And you can see over the last 20 years that, in fact, uh, the OECD countries, the amount of uh, energy that we've used has gone up slightly, but not very much. Whereas the energy usage from the non-OECD countries has gone up enormously. And of course, that's because they're now developing and they're wanting to create economies that will allow them to have lifestyles that we're all uh, used to. So can we really argue with them using that amount of energy? I find it difficult to do that. But it's, it's, that's where the, very ex the explosion of using energy has been in the last 20 years. So we've got that conundrum to solve and to consider. But I think perhaps uh, even more concerning to me is knowing that we have 7 billion people on the planet, about 1.6 or a fifth of the world's population have no access to electricity. And that's really quite a sobering thought, is it not? A fifth of the population has no access to uh, electricity. So here's the oil data for conventional oil discovery and production. And you can see here that we're getting a growth here. So we're, and we can go then predict it. But we're now... We're, we're running out of conventional oil sources, okay? This line is now over and above here, so to get to this line, we're having to use the oil that we already knew about over here. So that's a worry. If that line continues going up, and this predicted line does indeed go down here, then how are we going to supply oil for generations to come. Well, one suggestion is, of course, that we use extreme fossil fuels. We can use extreme fossil fuels. So now, for example, they're beginning to drill in the Arctic. The problem is, of course, when they drill in the Arctic to find oil, there was the one question as to who owns it. And there's a second question then is when they're 
uh, drilling for oil in the Arctic, they're releasing vast amounts of methane gas, which is trapped uh, under the uh, ice there. And they release that. And methane is a uh, greenhouse gas. I mean, if we have uh, trouble considering carbon dioxide, CO2 as a greenhouse gas, methane is much, much worse. So there are problems with drilling in the Arctic. You, uh, if, uh, in the North Sea, for example, we're having to go into deeper and deeper water now, so we're having to get more and more elaborate drigs, uh, uh, rigs rather, sorry, to drill down. Uh, and then, we, of course, we can come to shale, gas, and coal bed methane fracking. And we could have a whole discussion on fracking, and maybe later you'll come and ask me about fracking, and maybe we'll discuss it. Personally, um, I think it, uh, it's difficult about fracking. I mean, it, it produces gas and it produces oil, but actually what we should be doing is not burning these non-renewable resources and leaving it for generations to come, in my opinion, and we should be developing far more the renewable energy sources. Um, and really fracking has allowed us to be, become a little disconnected from the renewable energy uh, discussion. So although we have those concerns about fossil fuels, there are several more concerns that we have to have about fossil fuels. First of all is CO2 release. When you burn any fossil fuel, whether it be oil, gas or coal, you release carbon dioxide. You have to because you're burning a carbon source and you're burning a carbon source in oxygen and therefore you release CO2. So everything you burn, you will release CO2 into the atmosphere. And the amount of CO2 that is being released into the atmosphere is growing all the time. Here's a, um, a, a graph here showing you the increase of the amount of CO2 that's being uh, released all the time. And you can see that's an actual measurement. So there is no debate about the amount of CO2 is ever increasing. Now, whether you believe that that is then responsible or partially responsible for climate change, whether you believe it has anything to do with that, well, we can have that discussion as well. But undeniably, the amount of CO2 that is being released into the atmosphere day on day, month on month, year on year, is ever increasing. And remember, carbon dioxide is an acidic gas. And the oceans are responsible for dissolving large amounts of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So when you dissolve the CO2 into the water of the oceans, the, the pH, the acidity of the oceans will rise. And that is not good for the, uh, for the fish and the uh, marine life who live in the oceans. So that's another whole argument we can have as well. Energy security. The part of the world where much of our oil and gas comes from, which is this bit here, is not the most secure part of the globe, actually, you know, is it? And so, and so there are real concerns about energy security. So there again, why are we ever more reliant on our fossil fuels and burning them? But as a chemist, what makes me really, really cross is burning them. You, set, you burn them in oxygen, form the carbon dioxide, and then you've lost that valuable resource. There's so much more we can do with oil. There's so much more we can do with gas. We can use it as a feedstock chemical, and we'll need it as a feedstock chemical in years to come. So I think it's a terrific waste to burn it, because I can think of so much more exciting things to be doing with the oil and gas than simply burning it. Thank you. I'll calm down again. So let's look at the potential energy resources that we have in the world at the moment. So you can see here, here's the globe, here's the Earth, and the diameter, the size of that globe is indicative of how much energy we're using today. So if we take that as indicative of how much energy we're using, then if we solely relied on uranium 
and nuclear power, then we have enough uranium in the earth on, in, that we can mine to last us 30 years. So not even our lifetime, 30 years. If we were to burn all the natural gas we have, then it would last us 100 years. And then remember, I wouldn't have any more as my feedstock for my chemical reactions. If I was to burn oil, I would have 100 years as well. So it's not long. It's not a lot we have left. Coal, there's a huge amount. There's 20,000 uh, years worth of coal left on the planet. But bottom line, these are all non-renewable. Once they're gone, once they're burnt, they've gone. So how about then we look at the renewable sources of energy? So again, here's our globe. That's how much energy we're using. Um, for those of you who want to know, it's 15 uh, terawatts that we're at the currently uh, expected to use. And if we were to use every bit of ocean tide and current energy that's available and turn it all into electricity and use it, then it's, uh, we don't have enough oceans and tides and currents there to help us power all our needs solely using that energy source. We don't have enough. And we can go through hydroelectric as three, wind is four, that's as if you cover every available space with a, um, a wind turbine, both onshore and offshore. Um, geothermal and photosynthesis, that's using plants. Um, so you can see that we have trouble with many of these simply giving us enough energy to deal with what we want to. However, in Scotland, which is my land, is, um, there is enough tidal power around the coast of Scotland because we have quite extreme tides there, Pentland Firth, etc., um, to generate 25% of the EU's estimated total capacity. So in Scotland alone can produce, if we were going to do the uh, tide, and remember we don't have enough tide power for us all, but Scotland would, pr would produce 25% of that. And we could do 10% of the EU's capacity in wave power. And so for countries such as Scotland, then wave and sea power are there. They are there and they will be part of the energy mix. They will be for the country of Scotland and now that we're staying as part of the UK, whisper it, it will be part of the energy mix for the UK as well. Uh, and uh, it was... Uh, I should have shown you this. This is a, a wave tank that we've just opened uh, at Edinburgh University. Um, and if you ever get the opportunity to come and see it, do come and see it because it's really very spectacular. It's a, it's a round tank and um, it's there for testing, but it can do some wonderful tricks as well. But it, it is a, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of machinery and that's been uh, um, paid for by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the university and Scottish government. Uh, and this is simply uh, showing you uh, one of these devices actually in, uh, in the waves in tide uh, to generate electricity up in the Pentland Firth. So, but where's the answer? Well, there's the answer. Solar. Look how much solar power there is. Look how much energy is coming from the sun. Look how much energy is available from the sun. There is so much energy available from the sun falling on this planet that one hour from the sun will give us more than one year's worth of uh, energy for, he for all of us to consume. So think how much spare capacity we have there. Think how much we can give to 1.6 million people without electricity. Think how much we can help everybody who wants to have a lifestyle such as we have. 
There's loads of spare capacity in the sun. We just have to harness it. We haven't done yet, but I'm very hopeful that we will do. It is, of course, uh, a low energy density. The sun doesn't, you know, it's, 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 so we have to have cheap collection. It needs to be relatively cheap before it becomes cost effective. There is an economic argument for solar energy here that we have to consider. And the silicon cells that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, everybody uh, knows, sees and loves uh, are, are very pricey. They were first developed in around the 1950s and they were so expensive when they were delivered in the 1950s that the only place you could put them were to, sp uh, to power satellites because you couldn't power them any other way and it was cost effective to put them on satellites to power satellites. By the 1970s, you had solar farms in very remote areas of the world who could afford them. So, for example, in the middle of um, the Australian desert, for example, they could put uh, solar farms because it was too expensive to pipe in electricity any, uh, any other way and there was a lot of sunshine. So, in the 1970s, we had solar farms in the more remote areas of the world. But by the 1990s and up till today, you can see them on the outside of buildings. You can see them on the roofs. Um, uh, in this case, it's the, they're built in here into the balcony. So you, now you can have them and they're producing electricity, which is then put in, fed into the grid and used by us all. So the price has come down. But the price is still to come down further before it will compete um, on economic terms with our fossil fuels. There are two types of uh, solar cell. Um, the one, the silicon cell, is what's known as a PN junction solar cell, and Silicon or cadmium telluride is now getting a good run for its money or gallium arsenide are, are, are new materials that make up uh, these PN type junction type solar cells. And their benefits are that they're very, they're highly efficient. Well, they're high, they've got high efficiency. They're not highly efficient, but they've got a good efficiency. They're stable but they're expensive. They're expensive to produce and they're expensive to produce because you need to produce them in clean rooms. And they're very fragile, and they're very uh, brittle. The ones I've been working on are what are called dye-sensitized solar cells. Uh, and a dye-sensitized solar cell, won't, uh, you won't surprise you to hear, has to have a dye molecule in it. Uh, and these are uh, more molecular, <coughs> excuse me, in nature. They're cheap to make, they're low cost, they're lightweight, they are extremely flexible so you can see sometimes the, the, the cells on, the, on your backpack or something that you can charge up your phone as you're walking about in the sunshine and it's this type of cell that's used, um, but they're unstable. And by unstable I mean that they, um, they'll last for five five or so, ten years, but they don't have nearly the same stability as these silicon cells over here. Uh, and they're, um, at the present, they're much less efficient, well, they're not much less efficient, they're less efficient than the silicon solar cells. They're cheap to make because we can do it as a continuous batch process, a roll-to-roll a, a -roll manufacture um, in, in engineering terms. So, what is a dye-sensitized solar cell? Let me just briefly explain to you how you make a dye-sensitized solar cell. So, you have a transparent conducting, this is an electrode here. Um, here we're going to some electrochemistry and um, this is a great place to talk about electrochemistry. So here we have a transparent conducting uh, oxide electrode here. It has to be transparent because the light's got to get through it. Um, and then on top of that, we have these titanium dioxide particles. Now titanium dioxide is a semiconductor, um, but you see uh, titanium dioxide all the time. So 
your white paint, the very white paint you get, that's got titanium dioxide in it to make it white. Or the uh, cream you put on, you know, when you see cricketers with big white lips and things like that, uh, that's titanium dioxide, okay? So that's where the titanium dioxide is. So it, it's readily available, it's cheap, um, it's non-toxic. Uh, and then onto the surface of these titanium dioxide particles, we then bind on a dye molecule, uh, such as this here. This is probably the most famous dye molecule. It's Gretzel's molecule over here. Um, and that has to bind onto the titanium dioxide, and it binds through these acid groups here, these CO2H groups. So that binds on to that. Uh, you shine light on it, you generate electricity, and it goes round, comes through this electrolyte, which gives an electron to balance it, and so you've got your circuit produced. So that's the basic uh, cell design. So let me just show you a quick energy diagram here. So we've got our titanium dioxide, as I told you, bound on to, this is on to the, this transparent electrode. The light's going to come in here. Now, titanium dioxide is a semiconductor, and what a semiconductor means is that you have, um, a, a, on the energy scale, this is what's called uh, the valence band here, this is where all your electrons are in your titanium dioxide, and separated in titanium dioxide's case by about three electron volts, three volts to you and me, um, you have the what's called the conduction band. So there's no electrons in here, uh, but this band here, this energy, this region of uh, an energy space here, this can conduct electrons. If electrons get in there, they just can flow nicely. So we have this energy gap. This is our dye here, okay? So this is our dye, and this is our energy rest state of our dye here. And this is our excited state of the dye up here. And we're going to shine light on it and excite it, okay? So we shine light. That's the symbol for light here. We shine light. And what that light does is it excites an electron pumps some energy in, excites an electron from here, and it promotes it up to this energy level here. What you need to, for that to happen efficiently is for the dye to be highly colored. Because if it's highly colored, it's then absorbing all the energy from the sun, and all that energy from the sun is promoting these electrons from this state up to this state here. Now, what's crucial is that this energy level here is roughly, if you want to maximize your efficiency, you want it to be roughly the same energy as here. And so this electron, when it goes there, just hops across onto the titanium dioxide. So when that electron has hopped over here, that leaves your dye oxidized, or it's got a hole on it, yeah? It's short of electrons now, because it's pumped electrons into the titanium dioxide. So it's short of electrons. It doesn't like to be short of electrons. So it takes it from this uh, iodide, triiodide uh, electrolyte, uh, and uh, an electron just flows back here and gives us back our dye, and that's how the whole thing, because then the dye comes back to where it was starting with, and then you just promote another electron up, and so it goes round and round and round. Yep. And just to show you that, then the electron, once it's in here, just moves across to the uh, electrode and then goes round the circuit and does what, you know, lights your light bulb or makes your, boils your kettle or whatever you want to do with your electrons. There are some back reactions, there's some things you don't want to happen. So you don't want the electron to go from here back to here uh, or back down there or back that way, but I'm not going to talk about those. We're just going to be positive tonight. We're not going to worry about the problems. Much easier on the back of the envelope to do that. So here, this is Gretzel's uh, dye molecule. Though, uh, but you know, he, he discovered this molecule and all the work was done on it, uh, over 20 years ago. And it's still taken as the model and you measure 
if you make a new dye molecule, you measure your molecule against that one to see if it's better or worse. And it's still one of the better ones, I have to say. So well done him. So what do we need to have a good dye? Well, first of all, it has to be highly colored. So what that means is you have to have a good energy gap here between the starting, where the, the, um, the energy level of where it starts and the energy level where you excite it to. So that has to be full bang in the middle of the visible region, all right? So that's around 550 nanometers. That's where you want to absorb green, okay? That's why plants are green because that's, where, that's the middle of the visible region of the spectrum. We have to make sure that this molecule binds strongly to the titanium dioxide. We don't want it drifting off, so it has to bind strongly to this titanium uh, dioxide. And I've said to you before, you do it through these, this group here. It, it, it loses this hydrogen and it binds onto that surface there. So that, that gives you a good strong bond. Once it's on, it's on. I've said before it has to have a, uh, it has to absorb around 550 nanometers, that's green in other words. Um, it has to have what's called a high extinction coefficient, that means it has to be very strongly colored, all right? Because if it's strongly colored, then you only need a very thin layer of that solution and it'll absorb all the light. If it's more, uh, if it's not uh, strongly colored, then you're wasting the energy because it will just pass through the solution. You have to have what's called a long-lived excited state. In other words, once you've excited the electron up to this upper level, it's got to hang around and be able to transfer to other things. It just can't decay too quickly. Uh, and we want uh, good extensive charge separation, um, but we'll not talk about uh, all of those just now. So this is Gretzel's dye here, and it has an, an efficiency of 11%, roughly. So that is, if you, the sunlight falling on it, 11% uh, of it will be used up to form, you, you can, you, you can, it's efficient to 11% to get the electrons to do the business you want to do. So you, in other words, 89% of the light that's falling on it isn't being useful. So this is Gretzel's dye here, but when he made it, and it worked, the questions were then asked was, well, does it have to be this group? Can we put other groups on there? Does it have to be in this position? Can we move it there? Could we move it here? Bit difficult here, but could we move it? We've got these two other groups here. Do they have to be that? Can we change them? And over the years, people have varied all these groups to see what makes a difference and what doesn't make a difference. So I'll just very quickly uh, talk about some of the characterization techniques I've used uh, because what I've done is look at varying all these groups and seeing what makes a difference and what does not make a difference. So what's going to be good, what's not going to be good. So the main techniques I've used have been cyclic voltammetry um, and two, term, two types of spectroelectrochemistry. And I'll just briefly go through each and every one of, the, of them, but just very briefly. So electrochemistry, um, which this uh, institution has a proud and long history in electrochemistry. And I've used it all my days. That's uh, I've used a variety of electrochemical techniques, but the one I use most is what's called cyclic voltammetry. And in cyclic voltammetry, you have three electrodes, not the conventional two, we have three. And the only reason we, <coughs> excuse me, we have three is we put a reference electrode in so we can measure the voltage very accurately. Uh, and that's a typical cell there. And there's a typical cyclic voltammogram. My students call this the duck, for obvious reasons. Um, so here you start here, you increase the voltage, um, there's nothing happens, and then when electrons can flow in your compound, then you start seeing this uh, 
drop in current, and then it goes back as it goes back to the starting material again. But that's what a, a cyclic voltammogram is called. And here's, a, a, here's one in practice that uh, you can see it's real. It's not quite as pretty as the other one. Um, so here's a cyclic voltammogram for this uh, material. This ligand that we had before, remember, and we can change the position of where we've put the groups, and we've just changed the position from 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5. Don't worry about that nomenclature. We've just shunted it round the, the ring, okay? And you can see, I hope, that by shunting it, you can make a big difference. So, electronically, you can change the voltage at which electrons come and go from your electrode simply by changing where you put a group. And if you wish to, and uh, my students spend chapters of their PhD doing so, is you draw straight, you can get great straight line correlations um, with the group um, and its position. And it's very pleasing to get these lines because that means you fundamentally understand the electronic character of what's going on. So that makes you happy. Uh, and that's just showing you it, it's the same when you put it on a metal as well, because all these dyes have metals on them. So what I then developed um, and spent much of my uh, research career doing was developing techniques of spectroelectrochemistry. And what spectroelectrochemistry is, is to combine the techniques, uh, you can use a multitude of different spectroscopic techniques with an electrochemical technique. So you're combining two techniques. And the ones that I spent my life uh, developing were UV visible, um, just the normal spectrum that we see every day, and the more esoteric one of ESR, or sometimes it's called EPR, electroparamagnetic resonance spectroscopy, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So, what do you do? Well, what you do in this type of spectroscopy is you have a quartz cell, a piece of uh, a quartz container, a vessel that you put your liquid in, and this is uh, very narrow. This is only about one millimeter thick. And then you put an electrode in there that is a gauze electrode, so it's got holes in it so the light can penetrate through, but you can apply a potential, you can apply electrons from this gauze electrode. And then you put your other three electrodes in, because uh, other two electrodes, because remember we're using three electrodes here. So that's them. And then I put it in a, conta uh, in a, a container here. Uh, and this container then allows you to vary the temperature because we're going to do things at different temperatures because um, things can be stable or unstable at various temperatures. And you have to uh, uh, keep the temperature without, uh, if you go very cold, you don't want the whole um, system to frost up. So you, it's like double glazing. So we have another little bit of double glazing in there. Um, and then I apply the potential and the current flows, and at the same time I irradiate it and look at the spectrum. And as I, as I apply the potential, I'm going to put electrons onto the system, I'm going to reduce the system in the solution, and when you reduce it, it changes colour because you've put a different number of electrons in the system. And remember, colour is simply a movement of electrons from one energy level to another. So if you change the number of electrons in the system, you're going to change the colour. Because, it, because that's all that light, when you see something coloured, it's simply an electron moving from one level to another level. So I've gone from yellow to purple. And you can measure what's happening. So we start off and we measure our starting spectrum. There's our starting spectrum. We've got a nice band here, a nice large absorption band there. Fantastic. We then measure its cyclic voltammogram and we say, oh good, right, we now know that if we apply a potential to my grid electrode here, over here, then I'm going to pump electrons into the system. The system's going to like to take electrons. So if I hold the potential out here, what happens to my spectrum? 
Well, this is what happens to my spectrum. It changes. It has to change. Remember, it's changing color. It's changing color because we're changing the electronic population of the species we're looking at. So it, has to, it changes color, and so you see a different spectrum appear. So you see the bands for the starting material, the yellow material that collapses, and the bands for the purple color, they grow in. Great. So you can measure what's happening. That's the easy bit. You then have to interpret it, but that's the easy bit. And what you have to do after you've done that is you have to put the potential back to zero, and then what you, want, you observe happening is that the bands collapse, and you go back, the, the bands of the purple collapse, and as the yellow color comes back in, so the bands for the yellow grow back in again. And that's a good experiment. That's an experiment you go and open the bottle of champagne at the end of. Because that means your compound hasn't decomposed while you've been doing all this. And that means you understand that it's simply taking electrons on and off this system. So this is one example of, of one I've, uh, uh, the, uh, a compound we looked at. Um, and it's simply to show you here that there's the starting material, this yellow line here. And as we apply the potential, as we make it change color, we get beautiful bands growing in here and here. And then when we go and look over here, here's a compound now. We've put the same molecule here, over here. We've simply now attached it to a metal. And you can see exactly the same bands here and here growing in. There's other ones, don't worry about them, they're to do with the rest of the molecule there. But you can see exactly the same bands in there. And what's that telling you then is that when you reduce or put electrons onto this species here, the electrons are going onto this bit of the molecule. They're nothing to do with these bits or this bit over here. They're only going onto this bit of the molecule. And that's what you want to know, because that's what you want to measure, because that's the bit, remember, this bit, this this is the bit that's bound on to the titanium dioxide. So you want the electrons, when you excite it, to go into this bit of the molecule because then it can go around the rest of the circuit. So EPR is the other technique I spent a long time developing. And EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance, which many of you won't have heard of, what that does is measure unpaired electrons. If you've got a single electron, then you can measure it using this type of spectroscopy. Normally, electrons go round in pairs. But if you've got an odd one on there, then you can use this technique known as EPR spectroscopy to look at it, OK? So it's great. Because as I've said to you, most times uh, systems have two electrons in them. They're paired. I'm sorry, they have more than two electrons, but their electrons are always paired. And so you don't see any spectra. And then if you give it another odd electron, you suddenly see a spectrum. So uh, very similar as we had before. And this time, instead of passing visible light through it, uh, we look for a magnetic, we, push it past, uh, we have a magnetic field and excite it within a magnetic field. So what we see is the growth of a signal. As we change the material from yellow to purple, we see the growth of a signal coming in. It's not a very exciting signal. Uh, wouldn't tell you very much. But uh, that's what you see happen. Um, and when I first did this, uh, I had to also show that the signal that I got um, here doing it electrochemically, you could also do chemically, and you could also simulate it. So that was just a proof of concept in that case. But we can do all sorts of exciting things. And the wonderful thing about EPR spectroscopy is you, it's a very good tool to see how good your modeling is. We all know nowadays everybody talks about modeling. Everybody has to model everything. And it's a wonderful tool to do. Um, 
I know this week even the meteorological office has got a brand new, uh, huge, uh, very expensive computer so it can model the, the weather better. We all go in for modelling and EPR and modelling are two techniques that are, go very hand in hand uh, and all this is showing you here is this, is the, this was the uh, modelling, this is a calculation here and it, it agrees very well with the spectrum. And so what you can do with EPR then is you can plot absolutely, you can know absolutely where your excited electron, when you've excited it, shining the visible light on it, you can know absolutely where it's gone in the molecule. And that's very helpful when you're trying to design solar energy dyes. This was simply to show um, we can do experiments changing this group here. We can do experiments to show how many of these uh, acid groups. Um, and I don't think it's always been said that you need uh, more than one, but actually the efficiency, which is this number up here, the efficiency is pretty good with one as opposed to two, three or four. So we've done all sorts of uh, experiments, varying, varying uh, various parts of the molecule to see how it influences and how we can make a better dye. I wish I could stop now and say, and I've cracked it. I've got the better dye. I'm afraid to say I haven't. And when people ask me if I could go back now and do a start again, what would be the exciting science you would go and do for your PhD? And my answer is I would go back and do solar energy dyes. I would still continue doing that because we haven't cracked it yet. We haven't got there. We have to, for the reasons I've explained to you, we have to be able to make cheap uh, dye, cheap solar cells that will convert solar energy into electricity for the good of us all. And we haven't done it yet. So if I got the opportunity to start again, if I could roll the clock back, I would still do solar energy dyes, but I would do it differently because, of course, we know more now than we did when I first started. One thing to finish. Renewables are wonderful. So your, your, your tide or your wind or your sun, I do believe there'll be an energy mix and I do believe that we will, in fairly short order, be able to serve much of our energy needs using renewable energy sources. However, even when we do that, we're going to have to solve storage because the sun doesn't shine all the time. The wind doesn't always blow. We only have two tides a day. So we will need to solve a storage problem. Batteries is where a large amount of research is going, particularly in lithium batteries. But there's not enough lithium in this world to solve the battery problem using a lithium battery. We don't have enough lithium to do that. So we're going to have to change from lithium batteries. What I would do, because I'm a chemist, what I would do is I would use my renewable energy, whether it be from wind or whether it be from sun or wherever I've got it from. And what I would do is I would use, turn that into chemical energy. I would use it to break bonds and make new materials. So I would take something like CO2 that we've just said, we've got masses of it, but the carbon, carbon oxygen bond in CO2 is incredibly strong. It's one of the strongest bonds there are. It's an incredibly strong bond. And I would take the electricity I've made, the power, the energy I've produced, and I would break that CO bond. And I would break it and make some carbon hydrogen bonds. And I would turn it into a fuel, okay? And then I would turn it around the system again. But that's what I would do, because I think that's great. Because when you've got a lot of energy there, when you've got the sun shining and you can store it all up, then you take it, you take your CO2 that you've maybe buried under the ground, and you break all those carbon-oxygen bonds, and you turn it into something that you can useful. So you could turn it into methane gas, and then you could burn the methane, you could burn the methane gas again later. So I think, as a chemist, that's my solution the geologists or uh, the engineers will probably pump water uphill, which is another way of doing it, uh, et cetera. But there's, there's many different ways. But as a chemist, I'm going to break bonds and I'm going to make new bonds. 
So that's simply that. So simply, I'd just like to finish by thanking very much all my students. This is only some of them there. My students, thank them. Um, I would also like to thank, because you know, they did the work. I can come up with all sorts of ideas on backs of envelopes, but they're the ones that uh, have uh, worked with me and they've given me great pleasure and I've had great pleasure working with them and it's been wonderful to see them all go on and develop uh, and have great careers of their own. Uh, I need to also thank the Royal Society of Chemistry. I've thoroughly enjoyed being their president. And as their president, I've been very privileged to be able to go and speak to many different audiences across the world on both energy and on the lack of progression and retention of women in science and engineering. So I'd like to thank the Royal Society of Chemistry for allowing me to have that platform. I've not always been the president that they perhaps anticipated I was going to be. Um, but I've had fun. Uh, I'd also like to thank the University of Edinburgh for, uh, allow, uh, for uh, giving me my opportunities. I'm vice, currently vice principal and head of science and engineering there, and it's, uh, it's another wonderful job. I've had two wonderful jobs, the two jobs I always wanted in the world. I just quite never intended having them at the same time. <laughs> but I got all my Christmases at once. Uh, I'd also like to thank... Um, my wonderful support women. Um, we all need support and these are my supporters here and this was when I was first made president so they all came and we all had the most wonderful evening and finally to thank my family um, and we had the most wonderful day at Buckingham Palace this year when I got a CBE so we had a wonderful time but thank you all very much for listening to me. It's been a ball and thank you, thank you so much. not famed for sunlight in this country, no. and, yet, and yet plants manage to do very well. Absolutely. Um, is it possible to tailor the spectral properties of your dyes so they can take energy from, say, infrared?